welcome dear children to today's class in the previous classes you would have learned about king solomon the temple he built today we will see what happens after the death of king solomon before that let's see what money and power do to people let's take an example you want to buy a pair of shoes you have gone to the shop you like a pair but the cost is a bit high so you start bargaining with the shopkeeper and the shopkeeper also agrees to the price that you have set so you are very happy okay i have saved some money and i have got a pair of shoes that i like let's take another example you are hungry and you order for a pizza uh, the six slices or maybe eight slices let's get six slices so you eat after three slices and maybe a bite of the fourth you feel oh i'm full now i cannot eat the rest some of you will say okay i'll refrigerate it and eat it later some of you may just throw it away because there's no one else to share it dump it in the dustbin Now the pizza would cost around six uh, hundred roughly. Okay, five hundred maybe. And half the pizza is gone in the dustbin. So that's two fifty rupees waste. If I give a five hundred rupee note and ask you to burn it, will you do that? You say, are you mad? Money? We can buy so many things from it. And what did you just do with the pizza? Two fifty rupees in the dustbin. Money for shoes. We saved some money. We were happy. Money for pizza. Half the money is thrown away. Now, some time back, we didn't get water supply for a day, right? So, what happened in the house? Everyone running helter skelter. No uh, water stored in the house. so we need water for brushing for our daily needs for showering for washing the vessels and just for a day we are frightened what will happen will water come the next day but what are we doing about saving water when we are told to save water because we do not know what the future holds whether we will get water supply as we get it now or we have to pay money and buy water some standard has started with water security lessons asking them how to save water how to increase the capacity of saving rain harvesting other modes of saving water so we can do it in a small way right like close the tap and brushing or uh, use little less lesser water while showering and our other needs so money for water we see money required for material things yes now let's see another example voting voting for our candidate we find out who is the suitable candidate we have made up our mind whom to vote for and just a day before the elections what happens out of the blue some candidate comes and distributes gifts distribute things that you require even money and you're happy oh i got this from this candidate i got that and what do you do the next day the day of the elections whom you made up your mind to vote you leave that candidate aside and you vote for this candidate who has given you gifts so what have you done you have sold your freedom you have sold your right of thinking whom to vote for for a candidate who will do some work in your constituency in your community and you have gone ahead and voted for someone who has gifted you things so you become a slave to that candidate for the next whatever years that the candidate is elected so money for votes but what have you lost in the bargain you have lost your freedom your freedom of speaking 
your freedom of questioning the candidate that he is not doing something, he or she is not doing something in your area. Right? Do you understand the difference between money for shoes, food and money for votes? A step further. We have voted our candidates, sometimes uh, the candidate is an independent candidate, for example. You must have learnt in uh, history civics or you must be learning soon that you need a majority of a party to form a government. Now say the majority party is short by 10-12 seats. So what do they do? They don't go and sit in the opposition or they don't uh, say okay, we'll have elections again because a lot of money is spent in the elections just to conduct the elections, right? So they look at these independent candidates who have sto stood on their own, you know, like uh, they do not belong to any party. And they pay their money because these candidates have stood on their own uh, decision, their own uh, uh, work, work that they have done in their areas. But now that they are joining a majority party, what will happen? They are paid money to join them and they have to stick to the decision of the majority party. They cannot take their own decision. So what happens to the people of the constituency who have elected them? They have elected them that the candidate will do something for them, for the good work that they have done in the constituency. But now what happens? This is called as horse trading. After elections, after the candidate is elected, some other party comes and takes them away. Money for horse trading. So the candidate has given up on his freedom. He has lost your trust. You have lost your trust in the candidate. And there is unrest. There is frustration in the people who have voted for that candidate. So we are see a similar thing in today's class. Today we see how a political game can ruin the people, a kingdom. We see through the reflections and experiences of the people after the death of Solomon, how the kingdom is divided into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Let us see what it leads to. The books of First and Second Kings, although they're two separate books in our Bibles, they were originally written as one book telling a unified story that continues on from the book of Samuel that came before it. So David has unified the tribes of Israel into a kingdom, and God promised that from his line would come a messianic king who would establish God's kingdom over the nations and fulfill the promises made to Abraham. So the book of Kings tells the story of the long line of kings that came after David, and none of them lived up to that promise. In fact, they run the nation of Israel right into the ground. The book is designed to have five main movements. The story begins and ends focus on Jerusalem, first with Solomon's reign and the construction of the temple, and then in this last section ending with Jerusalem's destruction and Israel's exile to Babylon. And the story leading up to this tragedy is what makes up the center three sections, which explain how Israel split into two rival kingdoms, how God tried to prevent the corruption of Israel by sending the prophets, and how exile became the unavoidable consequence of Israel's sin. The book opens with two chapters about the kingdom passing from the aging David to his son Solomon. And David's final words to Solomon, they're very similar to those of Moses and Joshua and Samuel to the people. It's a call to remain faithful to the commands of the covenant and to give allegiance to the God of Israel alone. But David's words ring somewhat hollow here because David and Solomon then go on to conspire how they're going to consolidate this new kingdom through a whole series of political assassinations. It's not off to a great start. Solomon's brightest moment comes when he asks God for wisdom to lead Israel, and he even completes David's dream to make a temple for the God of Israel. Here the story actually stops and describes the design of this temple in detail, just like the tabernacle design in the Torah. There's all these gold and jewels and depictions of angels and fruit trees. It's all symbolism echoing back to the Garden of Eden. It's the place where heaven and earth meet, where God's presence dwells with his people. But no sooner does Solomon finish 
finish the temple that he makes some really horrible choices and the kingdom falls apart. He starts marrying the daughters of other kings, hundreds of them, for political alliances. And then he adopts their gods and introduces the worship of those gods into Israel. Solomon then accumulates huge amounts of wealth. He builds a huge army. He even institutes slave labor for all of his building projects. Now, if you go back to the Torah and look at God's guidelines for Israel's kings in Deuteronomy 17, Solomon is breaking every one. So by the time that he dies, Solomon resembles Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, more than he does his father David. The next section of the book opens with Solomon's son, Rehoboam, acting just like his father. It's a very sad story of greed and lust for power. He tries to increase taxes for slave labor. And under the leadership of Jeroboam, the northern tribes reject this. They rebel and secede and form their own rival kingdom. And so now in the story, you have the southern kingdom, Judah, centered in Jerusalem with kings from the line of David. And now this new northern kingdom called Israel, whose capital will be Samaria eventually. Jeroboam also goes on to build two new temples to compete with Solomon's temple in the south. He puts a golden calf in each one to represent the God of Israel. The connection to Exodus 32 and the golden calf, it's all quite explicit. From this point on, the story goes back and forth from north to south, tracing the fate of both kingdoms. Each one had about 20 successive kings, and as the author introduces each king, he evaluates their reign by a few criteria. Did they worship the God of Israel alone, or did they promote the worship of other gods? Did they deal with idolatry among the people? And did they remain faithful to the covenant like David, or do they become corrupt and unjust? And according to these criteria, the author finds no good kings in northern Israel, 0 for 20. And then in southern Judah, only 8 out of 20 get a positive rating, which connects to another huge purpose in this book, and that's to introduce the role of the prophets, key figures in Israel's history. So in the Bible, prophets were not fortune tellers. Rather, they spoke on behalf of the God of Israel, and they played the role of covenant watchdogs, which means they called out idolatry and injustice among the kings and the people. They were constantly reminding Israel of their calling to be a light to the nations, that they should obey the commands of the Torah, and so the prophets challenged Israel to repent and follow their God. In these center sections for each king, God then raises up prophets to hold them accountable. And the most prominent prophets are the northern ones, Elijah and his disciple Elisha, right here in the center of the book. Elijah was a wild man of a prophet living out in the desert, and his arch nemesis was the northern king Ahab and his Canaanite wife Jezebel. Together, these two had instituted the worship of the Canaanite god Baal over Israel. And so in a famous story, Elijah challenged 450 prophets of Baal to a contest to see which god was real. So they both build altars and pray to their gods, but only the god of Israel answers with fire. After this, Ahab uses his royal power to murder an Israelite farmer and then steal his family's vineyard. And Elijah again confronts Ahab's injustice and he announces the downfall of his house. Elijah eventually passes the mantle of his prophetic leadership to a young disciple named Elisha, who asks for two times the authority of Elijah. And what's fascinating here is how the author, he's recounted seven miraculous feats for Elijah, and then he offers stories of 14 acts of power from Elisha. Both prophets were clearly remarkable men, and they played the same role, confronting Israel's kings for idolatry and injustice. And ultimately, they were unsuccessful in turning Israel back from apostasy. In the next section, the northern kingdom is rocked by a bloody revolution started by a king named Jehu, who destroys Ahab's family. And although Jehu was at first commissioned by God, his violence just gets out of control, and it creates the spiral of political assassinations and rebellions from which Israel never recovered. Coup follows coup after Jehu, and each king follows other gods, allows horrible injustice. It all leads up to 2 Kings chapter 17. The big bad empire of Assyria swoops down and takes out the northern kingdom altogether. In the capital city of Samaria, it's conquered and the Israelites are exiled and scattered throughout the ancient world. Now chapter 17 is key. The author stops the story and offers this prophetic reflection on what's just happened. He blames the downfall of the northern kingdom on the idolatry and covenant unfaithfulness of Israel and its kings. And so God has allowed them to face the consequences of their decision. 
decisions. The final movement of the book tells the story of the lone southern kingdom. And here we meet some very heroic kings like Hezekiah, who trusts God when the armies of Assyria come knocking on Jerusalem's door, or Josiah, who discovers this lost scroll of the Torah in the temple. So he starts reading it. He's convicted and he institutes religious reforms to remove idolatry and Canaanite influences from the land. But Judah is just too far gone. The king, right in between these two, Manasseh, he's the worst by far. So he not only introduces the worship of idol statues into the Jerusalem temple, he also institutes child sacrifice. And so God sends prophets to say, the time is up. Israel has reached the point of no return. The final chapters tell the story of the Babylonian Empire coming to invade Jerusalem, destroy the temple, and carry the people and the royal line of David off into exile. And so the story ends leaving us wondering, is God done with Israel? Is he done with the line of David? Well, the final paragraph zooms about 40 years forward into the exile, and it tells a very odd story. It's about Jehoiakim, a descendant from David, who would have been king if he was back in Jerusalem. And the king of Babylon releases him from prison and invites him to eat at the royal table for the rest of his life, and the book ends. So it's not much, but it's a story that gives a glimmer of hope that God has not abandoned the line of David. So the question now is how is God going to fulfill his promises to Abraham, to David? How is he going to bless the nations and bring the message? The two books of Kings show a clear distinction between the two kingdoms. On the one hand, the kingdom of Judah, always ruled by a descendant from David, is seen as basically faithful to the covenant of the chosen people with their God. The kingdom of Israel, however, is seen from its beginning as straying from the covenant, representing God by the images of a golden calf or bull. As a consequence, Israel experienced continual political unrest. The people of God in particular, their kings will enjoy prosperity only if they remain faithful to the covenant with God. Otherwise, they will be condemned to trouble within the kingdom and invasions by their enemies. If the king is the one to first betray the covenant, then he is responsible for the ruin of the nation. Let us now quieten ourselves, sit erect, close your eyes, join your hands as we prepare to listen to God's word through one incident of intrigue soon after the death of Solomon which came to be traditionally called the sin of Jeroboam. A reading from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 12, verse 25, to chapter 13, verse 5. Jeroboam ruled in Israel in the north. He was jealous that the people went to worship in Jerusalem in the south and imagined that because of this, King Rehoboam of the south would become more popular. So he, together with his counsellors, built two shrines in their northern kingdom, erected golden calves and instructed the people to worship there rather than go to the temple in Jerusalem. For the sake of his own glory, the king had sinned himself and intrigued other people into sin. As Jeroboam was standing and offering sacrifice, God's messenger came to him and said, Thus says the Lord, A son shall be born to the house of David. Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you, the priests of the high places who offer incense, 
the altar shall be torn down and it came to pass that way the word of the lord thanks be to god this is exactly what happens when people in authority sell their honor and right judgment and connive with others to lead people astray when we refuse to live by god's law the end result can never be prosperity for all we need to convince ourselves that it does not pay to look selfishly to our own needs and manipulate others to achieve them our leaders today too face the same temptation and we need to watch out that we are not misled by them we pray for god's wisdom for the leaders as well as for us let us silently pray in our hearts to always have a good judgment to say no to temptation and to make the right decision in our lives today we saw how the kingdom of god is divided the north the south just because of greed for money and power that led to the fall of the kingdom and we later see leads to exile reminds me of abraham lincoln's letter to his son's teacher you can probably read it the one line that comes to mind is never put a price tag on his heart and soul never put a price tag on the heart and soul those who lose their circumstances and become slaves to money are leaders but nobody likes these types therefore it is better to fend off the temptation of money never put a price tag on your heart and soul for today's assignment Let's answer this question. Can you put a price tag on a person? Yes or no? If your answer is yes, illustrate it with an example. If your answer is no, illustrate with an example. You can either write or draw and express your decision. Do complete your assignments and upload it before the due date and time. To end this class, let's listen to the hymn Here I am Lord. You can join in the singing. Till we meet again. Take care and stay safe. Bye. I the Lord of sea and sky i have heard my people cry all who dwell in dark and sin my hand will save i who made the stars of night i will their darkness bright who will bear my light to them whom shall i send here i am lord is it i lord i
Here I am. 